Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 1, Chapter 7, Section 2, The Western Lineage. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny, and occasional contributor, Zong Jun Li, joining us from Shanghai. Hey, Pat. Hey, hey. Hey, Zong Jun. Hello. Before my first question, we are now approximately entering the last third of the book. We're coming to a set of conclusions that, at, at least in my mind, have been building over time. Do we want to look back and re-summarize some of the central themes and maybe not predict where this is going, but, but to think about how this leads into uh, the, the, fu the larger future of this series, this being only book one, then moving into books about uh, Yixing or Wu Yiti or Cha Zhou Gong Fu. Yeah, well, I gotta say, I think I think people are looking forward to those books that this is leading into. I uh, I do hope that you know all listeners and non-listeners alike, right? People who uh, have yet to become our audience, uh, I hope they will read this first before they go on to your other titles. Uh, but I'm sure you know. I think as we both know, uh, titles on things like Yixing are going to draw a much bigger crowd than theory, meta theory, and, and culture. Um, so you know, I think we we found uh, a crowd with that, but hopefully. Uh, since this is such a grounding book, I think for all future topics, I really would love if people would come through it. And hopefully if they read a book on Yixing or Yantra by you, right, they decide, huh, I really enjoyed that. And they'll go back if they skip this. You know, you, you were hoping for, I think, a little bit of a look back just to quickly say where we started the book. And then I'll pass it off to Zong Jun. Uh, we looked at, you know, how practitioners approach the practice. So we started out with functionalist view on uh, practicing tea ceremony. Uh, we moved into like structural functionalist phenomenology, discussed a lot about how perception, firsthand primary use uh, of wares, experience of tea, you know, paints your context, right, with, within tea ceremony. Um, I think you, you dived into, you know, where, where has tea ceremony been like um, driven in the past for progression? So was it coming from top down, bottoms up, and how will that look like in the future? After that, you know, we had the Bordodian analysis, right? Looking at who who it is uh, that is, you know, perceiving what. We moved really in depth into how wealth, right, impacts. Uh, I think your your learning not only in tea ceremony, but then your perception of tea and all other, I think, luxury goods. Uh, and you know, where where we're at now, I think you've kind of been building up to a point where I think we're still we're still moving into the future. This has been a lot of present, past, and now I think we're really going to dive into the future in the next couple of chapters. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing, like, I think you're you're going to give us uh, the prescription to what ails us for the future of tea ceremony. Um, I'm waiting for, the, like, you know, the oracle to pass down the prophecy in the next few chapters. So if that doesn't happen, I'm going to be really upset and I'm going to want a, a refund. Uh, but I don't know, Zongjun, where, where, where have we come? Where are we going? What are you looking forward to? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, definitely I want to refund too, but <laughs> but I think so far, um, you know, all the materials that we have discussed and uh, will be discussed in uh, later part of this book, um, I think will serve a really good foundation um, to you know what we are going to uh, be focused on in the future, like uh, different aspect in different regional practices, um, like we or uh, you know the context of uh, Yixing being utilized in different ways and um you know how it was built how it was uh used in the past and how it was uh, how it is used right now uh and how it can be be used in the future jason well, am i spot on i hope so because i i i've spent that money no one's going to refund <laughs> yeah what did you spend um did, should we not tell them the, about the uh caviar and tea pairings the, the caviar and tea pairing sessions um that only that you know believe it or not that only works uh, with in in uh, the Ming Dynasty shipwreck teapot club, you know, um, I knew it, I knew it. Or or maybe it was you know you did have to do a lot of research on Rolex when you were writing the uh, you know uh, part of the wealth and knowledge section. So maybe it was buying a new Rolex. Well, it was it was you know for the for the shipwreck teawares, it's really the salty briny aspects brought out by the shipwreck Yixing's really high halo the the caviar and vice versa. It's, Makes perfect sense to me. Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it. Thank you to all our subscribers. And as you are tasting the caviar, you know, on your uh, side of your hand, um, you know, the reflectance of light from your Rolex or Pedophilip uh, is definitely going to affect your perception and preference towards it. <laughs>
<laughs> my first question. Is it possible to learn Chinese tea ceremony from books or blogs? Yes, you, you can learn, right, through books, through blogs, um, but it's it's not going to get you to your end goal, right? Like if you if you just want to make better tea than you currently make, uh, you just want to make your tea taste a little less sour, you know, a little more sweet, um, sure, gain, gain some knowledge, read a book, uh, read a blog, um, but that's not going to make you a much better tea practitioner. It might just help you brew tea a little better. Um, and I think those are two different things, right? Practicing tea ceremony and, and brewing tea a little better, right? In a, in a teapot or a cup. Um, it, it's not the same thing. So I think if you really uh, want to practice tea ceremony, you want to bring your tea learning and practice to another level. Um, I think there is uh, a degree of in-person learning or learning from a higher level practitioner that has to occur. Uh, if you just want your tea to not taste as bad as it does, <laughs> you know, if you want to go from beginner to beginner plus, um, sure. Yeah, I think books and blogs are great. Can you join a textual lineage by reading a book? I think you still have to practice. I, I don't think, I, I, I think while lineages can be heavily focused on text without that in-person practice, I don't think you're going to go anywhere. I mean, yeah. you know, think, think about like all, we all read books and blogs, right? This is a book that we're working on, right? Reading it and building up that knowledge, that body of knowledge is great, but uh, you still got to pick up a guy one at some point, right? Or a teapot. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I, I give you a more, you know, not so much of tea related uh, example, but, you know, um, a very famous general back in the uh, spring, uh, spring and autumn and warring dynasty period. Uh, his name is called Maji. And uh, he's a like really loyal follower of uh, the book uh, Art of War. So he took a lot of those theories into practices. And one of the th theory he took um, from, uh, you know, the chapter is called uh, So when he was fronting one of the uh, opponent's uh, army, um, he decided to follow that uh, theory, uh, which rough, roughly translated to, um, if you position yourself in height, in, in, you know, in a higher land, um, you go down um, to, you know, uh, to to your enemy like you breaking through a forest of bamboo. Um, so he really followed that theory and uh, and ending up using it uh, in one of the battle with um, the opponent's army. Um, but uh, what he actually happened is that he had his own army set up in a little hill and end up surrounded by the entire army of his enemy. So in a very lonely position. So he ended up, you know, defeated uh, by the enemy uh, because he cannot, you know, you any help or escape to any places. Um, so end up like getting defeated by uh, uh, by his opponent. So I think that's a that, that would be a good example to know to for for you know uh, people to uh, being a real loyal follower of the books or texts, um, but without really you know understand the meaning or you know all the implication behind it, um, due to lack of practice or lack of um, usage in uh, you know real life. I love that, and uh, Song Jun, really happy to have you here to dive into those kind of details because that was just so fun. But uh, yeah, there's no there's no theory without practice. There's no practice without theory, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, you, you really you're not a practitioner unless you have both. As long as we're talking about the art of war, I have always stood by the uh, by by the phrase that if you wait by the river long enough, your enemies will float by. <laughs> Sun Tzu is pretty metal. Everyone just seems to come out of the woodwork to uh, want to debate every <laughs> most of what we write about or talk about here. <laughs> so oh, I thought you were talking about the hate mail you get. Yes, yes, but that I enjoy. You solicit <laughs> that, yeah. I solicit it for this for the okapi hunting. I don't know. I don't think we, we haven't gotten enough debate on, uh, you know, the book postings, but maybe uh, the people who would debate us have decided that they don't want to pay to read your book. Maybe that's what it was so far. Yeah, we've gotten some great commentary. We've gotten some great feedback, uh, but we haven't really had anyone come out and say, you know, every everything you're doing is wrong um, and, and, you know, for reasons X, Y, and Z, um, which if you're out there and you're listening to this, uh, please do so. We, we, we would love to have that debate. Civilized professional discourse, you know, on, on these topics is the only thing that's going to drive the praxis forward. Or, you know, if we get to a point where we both disagree and we just can't settle it, it's got to come down to a brew-off. Whoever brews the better cup of tea is the winner. You just have to walk away. 
fruit to the test. Head over. My next question, if the Western lineage is textual, why are there so few foundational or instructional texts on Chinese tea ceremony in Western languages? So I'll take a swing. I, I think maybe the, the base of interested practitioners maybe is not large enough to merit uh, thoroughly vetted, researched, uh, and, and written publication, right, to the point that it could be thought of as a textbook or a reference book on tea uh, ceremony in and of itself or the practice, right, of making tea. Because we know there's a, there's a ton of, I would say, not very good books on how to brew tea. Um, uh, talking about maybe more books that came out 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, I've seen quite a lot of old texts in English on how to brew tea that, uh, you know, I've, ha I've had a chance to look over in you know, my, my past 10 years of, of brewing and practicing tea. Um, a lot of them are really terrible. I've shared some pictures with you, Jason, on some of them. I think that, yeah, there just might not be a large enough consumer base to, to warrant, you know, a large publishing house really backing and giving the, the money and funds to uh, someone trying to write a foundational text on tea ceremony. It is a great question. Why do we have to go to the internet to learn more about tea? You know, why, why isn't there? you know, tea ceremony 101 book that you could pick up at a university library. Yeah, I mean, even even if in Chinese, you know, we have a lot of, you know, these uh, round of bad information flowing around, uh, both in the internet and in uh, different forms of text material, like magazines and books, but with a few jewels and pearl that uh, one can discover. But it's always uh, surrounded by a lot of other misinformation, which needs some critical thinking and, uh, you know, experience to be able to discern that. Right. I think that's particularly dangerous, too, though, because the uh, new practitioners, the people who need that book, right, or that text that's for beginners to start them off on their journey, uh, they don't have the ability to discern, you know, what is what is truth and what is slight truth and what is not really truth. Um, there's a lot of that fine blurring between what is what is really a, a good kernel of knowledge for tea and what is not. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like someday someone came up to me and asked what's the, uh, you know, uh, meaning or uh, the benefit of like uh, doing the phoenix nodding head, um, doing a pouring of tea. And uh, for that, I can definitely tell that uh, that person was definitely reading something wrong. <laughs> could, it, could it be that the textual center of the Western lineage is not in foundational texts, but in something that is uniquely Western, right? On the tea review blogs, on the vendor review blogs, on the idea that th these Chinese teas are, are rare and expensive and difficult to source, and I need to see what other people are saying about them before I, before I buy them or before I buy samples, right? I want to engage in the conversation on these samples. Could it be that that is a uniquely Western attribute uh, of, of the textual lineage that has become dominant here, the online tea hermit Western lineage? Yeah, you'll, you'll learn more about, uh, you know, how to start a tea practice, how to get into tea, how to brew tea from, uh, you know, reading through a couple of Discord th threads than you probably will from most of the books that target tea beginners uh, in the West. Of course, there's a couple of great books, um, but I, I think, you know, scroll through Discord for a while. Uh, you'll, you'll learn some bad stuff, but you will learn some really good stuff. And at the same time, I don't know, you might make some friends too. So there's uh, added benefits where I think the the Western tea community is, is focused a little bit more on that community aspect and maybe not particularly the development of, of skill uh, in the way that, you know, we're focused in our kind of uh, literati uh, pursuit of tea. So I, I think you're right in saying that, you know, the focus is not on tomes and textbooks. It's on, you know, quick chats with your friends or people you believe know a little bit more than you. Uh, so people are still getting that exposure to what who they deem as advanced practitioners, um, just in a virtual forum. But isn't it strange that we say that the dominant thread in the Western lineage right now is uh, tea hermits, and yet the tea hermits are focused on community? What, where is that? Where, where is, isn't that almost an oxymoron? Virtually together, <laughs> physically apart. And asynchronously together, right? If someone writes about a tea from a vendor and then people over time read and comment on it or purchase the same tea. But why is that such a uniquely Western facet of the Western lineage, Western discourse? Zongjun, right, you spend, you spend many years in the United States, you spent many years in China. Does something like this exist in China or do people in China 
get together and drink tea instead of posting online about tea reviews. Yeah, I'll say um, like people here definitely uh, will more tend to gather offline, you know, in a tea shop and drinking tea together. But I think they also kind of converged um, in a sense that um, it's like the community is also led by a few, um, you know, opinion leader, um, which usually the more experienced, you know, tea practitioner or tea master. Um, and they end up like learning more um, from, uh, you know, the leader and sometimes end up buying his or her tea. Um, so the end goal is definitely similar. Um, but uh, I'll definitely say that the, uh, the online discussion is far less um, than uh, what I have seen in the West. And is the online discussion as dedicated to vendors and tea reviews, or is the online discussion something else? Uh, it's usually something else. Usually, of like people will ask questions in forums, uh, and people start to like you know follow up with um, their research or their opinions, um, but not so much of um, you know uh, from a vendor to consumer uh, direction. You know, in, from the day. The data that I have uh, that that I have seen, um, I think as as of twenty twenty, um, the total uh, online like the total tea market um, in China, online sales only uh, contribute eight point seven percent of the total sales of tea in China. So most tea are still purchased offline. Pat, did that jog anything for you? Uh, I, I just I really like that figure because what that's telling us is. You know, people are in person buying tea, you know, tea, probably tasting it, right, uh, as they're buying it, forming those communities and shops, forming relationships with those vendors. Uh, and it's just so different from how I would say we we do it standard in the U.S. So I, I, I'm lucky enough to live in a city that has a lot of tea shops. Uh, Jason, you can say the same, right? And, you know, I, I've got vendors I like. I can pop into tea shops pre-COVID times and drink some tea you know, have fun with, uh, you know, some of the regulars um, and of course pur purchase some tea while I'm there. Uh, but I would say the majority of tea purchases, as you were mentioning, Jason, right, are, are done online in the U.S. And as we have uh, more, uh, I would say, you know, especially in the past five years, there's been a larger and larger influx of new practitioners. Uh, they want some reassurance, right, that the vendors that they're buying from are uh, good, the products they want to buy uh, taste good, are a good place to start, right? Um, and so I think they're hungry for that kind of knowledge, tea reviews, uh, vendor reviews. And I think that's why so much of, you know, uh, the way the blogosphere has developed in the past uh, five to seven years has been focused around that. Um, you know, as these, this kind of, I would say, past wave of new practitioners develops and hopefully advances and, and you know, deepens their connection with the praxis, what are they going to want to see? And is that going to change the way that our current, you know, uh, bloggers or thought leaders or, you know, publishers, et cetera, uh, produce this information or the information they choose to produce? I, I do think so. I don't think, you know, even the most dedicated bloggers, I don't think can write about just tea reviews for 10 years, uh, which I think we've seen, right? A lot of people who just do tea reviews stop blogging and maybe they come back after a couple of years, um, but often they don't. And if they do come back, uh, they usually decide they wanna write about some different topics. I think the most successful bloggers are the ones who have kind of left themselves a little more open to write about what they want. Which most definitely does not include my cult of quality blog. Hey, or me, you know, I blogged for a hot six months. Zongjun, you just use uh, Weibo or uh, QQ? You're for posting just, tea yeah you just do some micro blogging right yeah 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 we chat or sometimes on uh, instagram <laughs> joining joining the western tea community on instagram not tea uh for oh no not tea song june doesn't post tea for, <laughs> i mean i mean not not all tea uh, <laughs> scotch you know wine <laughs> cigar all the fine things but yeah with, like a know, boss shared connoisseurship <laughs> Are there other unique attributes of the Western lineage in comparison to the contemporary high-level Chinese or greater Sino lineage? I think that's a question for you, Zongjin. It's been uh, been about four years since I've been in Taiwan practicing tea. Similarities. Hmm. Well, un unique attributes of the Western lineage in comparison to the to the Chinese lineage, and I'm including the greater Sino Sino lineage in in that question, which includes Malaysia, Singapore. Etc. 
I see. And referring to Western lineage, um, like who exactly are we talking about? Like, it's a very good question. Um, the question is focused predominantly on uh, North American, Western Europe. Russia very much has its own tea culture, powered by warp pylons and energy crystals. And a lot of shopuer. <laughs> stemmy, stemmy shopuer. Those guys drink a lot of shopuer in Dien Hong. Oh my God, you see those photos? Just so much, <laughs> so much shopuer, a lot of dark liquids. For Western lineage, what I experienced uh, for the most, uh, you know, part of my life was uh, back in the Teen Institute in Penn State. Um, so I think one of the unique uh, characteristic of uh, what we uh, have been doing in the past, um, you know, in the Institute in comparison to, uh, you know, tea lineages in, in China or, you know, greater China area, um, is that uh, we took, um, for, for a lot of aspects, we took a really, you know, scientific uh, mindset um, and um, almost like a girl kind of mindset um, to wanted to understand or investigate um, the mechanism of a lot of the practice, which um, a lot of um, the Chinese uh, lineages took as granted. Uh, like, you know, like we always pair um, Yixing or a uh, Juni with like uh, Yan Cha or certain type of tea or Zisha with a certain type of other tea or we never brew, uh, you know, green tea in uh, Zisha but always in Gaiwan. Um, and what's the effect of, you know, those wares, those utensils towards the tea uh, exactly. So that, that was something that we, we cared about and it was not particularly a center of conversation or a point of interest in a lot of, um, you know, Chinese tea lineages or community that I have been to. I, I think that's an awesome point, right? I think um, we really didn't like to take anything for granted, speaking specifically of our time at the Tea Institute, right? So even when Jason would propose a hypothesis for how he thinks something works, um, you'd still have 10 of us saying, uh, well, that doesn't really make sense to me. And, you know, some of us were more chemistry heavy, some of us more math, and you'd have people starting trying to plot out equations for how they think what Jason's explaining would work and why it doesn't. And, um, you know, it really was quite a, quite a center for thought, right? And a lot of thought exercises on how a lot of, um, as you said, the practices we take for granted work, right? So um, I think, you know, in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of discussion on Linghu, right? Uh, on, on the blogosphere and, uh, you know, send people saying for specific teas, you always have to do it. Some people saying, well, actually, you know, if you do Linghu, it actually cools down your Yixing. Um, some people even taking out a thermometer, not, not particularly an infrared one, right? Uh, but uh, some people trying to, to do measurements, right? And that's, that's good. That's what we want to see, right? That's the kind of stuff we were doing uh, is trying to have some kind of experimental design and test our hypotheses. Um, so I, I love that you brought that up, Zongjin. Um, I think another unique attribute of the Western lineage um, is, you know, when we think about maybe specifically North America or America, uh, there's a strong degree of individualism, um, especially when we would compare, I guess, the kind of stereotypical American versus uh, stereotypical maybe Chinese tea practitioner. Uh, so I think Americans are very readily accepting of different techniques or ideas uh, if they see it as, you know, a way to improve their practice, or even if they don't think of it that way, but they think it looks cool and they want to try it, um, they'll, they'll often accept, you know, any cool technique they see and give it a try. Um, and I think that's, you know, it can be a good thing. It can be a fault. You might pick up a lot of bad technique that way, but I think that Americans or the Western practitioner, maybe more so, is very willing to make their practice heavily syncretic. They're not really concerned about, is this just a Chinese tea practice, but is this just a way that I can brew tea better? Uh, which I think is very in line with, you know, the original uh, thought practice of some of the earlier practitioners like Lu Yu, who, you know, explored, tried to figure out what technique would make his tea better. And I'm sure there was a lot he found that did not make his tea better. Uh, but over time, you know, with that kind of scientific mindset, um, he was able to, you know, brew a better and better and better cup of tea. Um, so I think, you know, the Western practitioner doesn't reject new ideas and doesn't have that same sense of maybe traditionalism, which allows them to have a very syncretic practice. What does the Western lineage need to do to progress or to remain fertile? For one, I, I do like how strong the new wave of practitioners has been. I feel like there's more people getting into tea than I've ever noticed before. Uh, I feel like they have 
better questions there, really poking the boundaries of uh, some of the traditional thought and, you know, kind of to the point that Zong Jun had made there, they're not particularly accepting of the traditional reasoning for why some things work, um, which is great. So I think that more practitioners is good, but those practitioners have to want to drive the practice further. Uh, and that's that's kind of the crux of, I think, both this section of the, the chapter, um, but also, you know, this moment in time and how we move the practices forward. Um, so we, we need both these new and advanced practitioners alike to decide on maybe a focus area, figure out something that you really like in tea ceremony, and start studying the hell out of it. And whatever you learn, start sharing it. Uh, Cause you know, it's, it's pretty impossible. I think for as, as one person to advance all areas of, of tea practice and tea ceremony. Uh, but I think each of us is capable of moving the needle forward on one specific attribute. If you love charcoal, fi figure out, you know, start, start experimenting with charcoal. If you love clay, uh, really get into regional clay. Um, if you love a very specific type of tea, just, go like all in on just, you know, Sui Shen from one specific area of we and just become the master of that. Um, so I, I think that's what we need is, is, you know, what we have this giant wave of practitioners. So let's have some of them specialize and see how far we can go. I think that's a really good mindset because like for one to experience experience Chinese tea culture um, in first hand, um, they might end up actually meeting a lot of the fake tra tradition, you know, like, if they end up working into a random tea shop like Tianren and they tell you like like point your thumbs out as the dragon head and point your pinky out as the phoenix tail like those like really gobbledygook fake tradition um, is definitely not part of traditional Chinese tea culture and it doesn't do anything good to your tea um, but you know be able to stay um, you know um in a more critical mindset um to 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 engage with chinese tea culture i think it's actually a unique um benefit of how um you know people outside of uh Ch china or greater china area to learn tea uh, because the lack of contacts actually um makes you um can position you in a more objective way of looking at the culture as a whole um, whereas um, for, you know, a Chinese living in China, they born uh, with Tianren surrounding them and they might actually end up like taking those tradition as granted, um, but those are not the true tradition. Right, the constructed tradition. I know it's a little off the topic of what uh, Jason was specifically going down, but um, I think what you brought up there was really interesting, Song Jun. So, you know, Western or maybe non-Chinese practitioners, right, I think as beginners do have that unique advantage of having none of the let's say cultural or historical uh, baggage upon them. They can learn very freely. Uh, I would argue though, that as you become a, maybe, you know, an intermediate or an advanced practitioner, uh, not having the depth of knowledge in Chinese culture, history, or particular language does become a barrier to learning more. So I would say, yeah, maybe as beginners, right? Um, we're a little bit more free to learn what we want, but then suddenly we realize a lot of the really good information is in Chinese. That's why I'm here. <laughs> We love you. That is certainly doubly true in anything dealing with ceramics. If you didn't grow up surrounded by the, the arts, the motifs, the, the meanings, um, I, that can be really quite difficult. Oh, I was going to say, you know, as that applies to literature and poetry as well, right? I mean, for you and I to get a lot of the uh, allusions, uh, you know, in our metaphors in, in even Qing Dynasty, right, tea writings, it, we really require someone who's an expert like Song Jun, really, right, to, to provide some of that context to us because just a lot of the prose that is, uh, you know, heavy in motifs and metaphors and references, we, we don't have that frame of context for. So it definitely does, does become helpful as you become more and more advanced, I think, to have that cultural understanding. Are there any tea lineages in danger of dying out? We are, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't see uh, Korean tea, right, having or not to say Korean tea, but Korean tea ceremony, globally having the same development. We're not, I'm not seeing it spread the way that I feel like I've seen Chinese tea really pick up in the Western community in the past couple of years. Korean teas in and of themselves, I think are becoming a little bit more well-known or more popular. Um, but just because people are drinking Baleo Cha now doesn't mean I see anyone practicing tea rites, right, or Darye. So I'm doing any other tea lineages in danger of dying out? I'm sure there's some small Japanese schools too of tea practice that are probably in danger, but we, they're probably so small that we haven't heard of them. Yeah, well, in China, um, you know, now the uh, the 
uh, Chaozhou or uh, the Wu, you know, Wu way of uh, practicing tea are, uh, you know, start to grow into the mainstream, and uh, it's how what you know regular people would perceive as the uh, the right tea ceremony. But there are a lot of other lineages in like Yunnan. Um, where the uh, local Bulang brew their own tea, you know. Uh, if you have been to Yunnan or Bulang, um, the locals actually drink green tea uh, for most of the time instead of uh, pu'er. Um, so their way of drinking tea um, is really confined regionally. Um, as and also as the youngsters start leaving, you know, um, their villages to cities to seek fortunes, um, those lineages or um, you know ways of drinking tea um, are uh, slowly dying out and are start to uh, you know fade away in uh, as the old tea pra practitioner or tea makers uh, passing away. What about something like Sichuan Funga, where you're drinking directly out of the very large gaiwan? Certainly, as uh, I've never seen people doing that in real life. <laughs> Maybe I've, ne I've not been to Sichuan enough. I think, uh, you know, we, we're kind of focused with our answers on uh, tea ceremony lineages, um, but I'm sure tea production, right? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of tea, you know, makers who maybe their children, right, have left, as you said, Zongjun left the village, they're going into the cities. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of tea makers who are making really awesome teas uh, probably don't have anyone to pass that information on to, because uh, it's not like they tell, you know, all of their factory workers, pickers, whatever, uh, exactly what's going through their mind when they're making these teas. I'm sure it'd be very hard when some of these, uh, you know, masters either pass away or aren't able to, to pass on that information uh, yeah. to, to accurately replicate what they made was probably going to be near impossible. Yeah, certainly. Uh, especially for those tea that are not so profitable or recognized widely by the market. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, there is a, a particular type of steam, uh, uh, steamed uh, kill green, so zhengqing uh, green tea uh, that's in production in China is called um, uh, xianrenzhang cha which can roughly translate it to cactus green tea. The, the method was lost for a long time, and it was recently uh, brought back and revived by one of the state-run tea production factory. Um, but it's like really not profitable because not a lot of people drink it or recognize it or know what it is. Uh, so, um, so for cactus green tea that have the fortune to, you know, get uh, revived that by a state-run tea production factory, a lot of the other teas are just like uh, destined to, to pass away or get forgotten um, as uh, people or tea maker, you know, start to, uh, you know, dying or, you know, fail to pass their uh, tea making knowledge to future generations. I think the, the steams tea as a methodology, right, is, is very interesting because, you know, we see, of course, in a very mechanized sense, it's alive and well in Japan. Um, but Korea, I think, kind of faces the same issues that you had mentioned with China, where, you know, there's, there is a, you know, traditional steamed uh, green tea processing method in Korea. I believe it really belongs to one lineage, right, of, of tea makers and tea practitioners. Um, and if it's not chosen to be passed on, I'm sure some people can try and recreate it, but it, it probably won't taste like the same tea. Um, we had an opportunity to taste it, I believe, what, in 2011, 2012. Uh, and I, I don't think I've had that tea since, actually. Jason, have you had a chance to have it? I have not. Uh, so, you know, that that's definitely, I think, steaming just as a methodology outside of the mechanical, very heavily commoditized sense. Uh, we, we've definitely seen less and less and less over the decades. and. Could, could disappear into the ether if there's not projects like what you mentioned, Songjin. What are you personally doing to preserve the Western lineage and progress the praxis? Rambling on a podcast? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a great question, actually. Um, I, I would say that where I'm at, both in my like professional and personal roles, I'm definitely at a point where I am still spreading quite a lot of knowledge to new practitioners. Or trying to build a passion for people to become tea practitioners, right? Get them excited, ignite that flame. You know, that's in all of us. Where uh, once once it's lit, uh, you're going to be a tea lover for the rest of your life. I would say, as far as uh, teaching the you know uh, beginner plus or intermediate practitioners, uh, there's a lot more I could do, and there's a lot more I can do to push my own knowledge and boundaries and. Uh, that's why it's been wonderful over about the past year, uh, right? A little bit late into COVID, we all decided that 
hey, I know we're all virtual, but we're working virtual. Why don't we all start, you know, having tea together again more frequently? Uh, so over the past year, you know, once again, uh, with, you know, Jason, Ryan, Song Jun, uh, a couple other, you know, Teen Institute alumni, been able to try and push my practice a little bit more actively again. Um, so it's been nice being more in a realm where I'm facing uh, peers versus trying to teach uh, absolute beginners. Uh, and that, that's helped me to kind of reignite some of my passion to study a little deeper in certain areas. Uh, so I, I've been, I think, kind of going back to the basics for a little while this year, really practicing uh, my foundations for uh, pouring, being present at the tea table, uh, putting my phone away when I'm going to brew tea, not taking Instagram pictures, right, and, and really focusing on um, my wares, my interaction with them. Um, from here, I, I think I have to find what I want to study, um, but I'm, I'm happy to keep uh, sharing in what you're learning, Jason, and uh, hopefully find what I really want to learn about. My final question, do you have a personal secret teaching only available to your students? Definitely, but it's a secret. You know, if we if we up the price of the subscription, maybe I'll reveal it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it will be coming in the next book <laughs> yeah, the secret teachings <laughs> that's the last book that's the last book 10, ten years in 10 books in was a, the final book the secret teachings yeah but we're only going to publish 50 and once they sell out you'll just have to buy it on Amazon for like $600 <laughs> yeah it's good blurry screen caps on Reddit Song Jun do you have the secret teaching secret teaching hmm well, I think maybe since I gave a real bullshit answer, uh, I'll just espouse a little bit more on what I was thinking before I uh, pass it on to you, Zong Jun. But um, Go ahead, I, 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 I do actually think I, I do have a very specific, uh, some specific teachings that were not taught to me, right, that I have in the past a uh, little over a decade decided that it improves the way that I brew tea and the way I approach tea. And um, I, I don't think those teachings are... Uh, a, you know, ABC list of this is what you have to do to brew better tea. Um, it's very much a way to approach tea. It's a way to sit down at the tea table mindset. It's not like it's something that nobody could do. Uh, it's just not when, when someone's just starting tea, it's not the way that I try and, you know, bring them into the tea world. It's not a super accessible teaching. Um, but once I, you know, I've decided someone is very into tea and they're, they're showing that they want to learn more. There's another side, right, to tea that they want to get deeper into. I'm not just talking about a spiritual practice or anything. Um, you know, that's when I will decide to, to showcase maybe some of these techniques that I have. But it's, it's not a way to pour or anything like, well, sometimes it is. But it's, it's more, I think, a, a mindset and a way to approach brewing tea. Uh, and so secret teaching sounds very fancy. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, something that I was maybe not directly taught, but I've seen in other high-level practitioners. And I think the light doesn't always switch on. And so when it's pointed out to you, uh, it, it helps uh, those intermediate practitioners see how they can jump to that next stage. So that's my secret teaching. And if you want more, uh, you know, uh, 10 easy payments of fourteen ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, I guess for me, you know, like um, echo with some of the previous points that I have already made in this podcast, um, don't take anything as granted will be my secret first secret teaching. Uh, if, you know, someone were want to learn more about he, um, you know, from me or from, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, tea practitioners around me, uh, don't take anything as granted or even, you know, um, knowledge in the book or even knowledge from other, you know, more experienced tea practi practitioner, uh, you know, experience um, the thing by yourself and really take a what um, you, you think will work for you um, instead of other people telling you what has worked for them. So you want to learn Zongjun's secret teaching before you learn mine, so you can approach it critically. <laughs> and then once you've learned Zongjun and mine's, you can get the trifecta. Jason, what's your what's your secret teaching? All, all of my secret teachings result, revolve around Ming Dynasty shipwrecks. <laughs> Perfect, so super accessible. <laughs> very, very accessible secret teaching. <laughs> <laughs> how, to, how to pair your Jen Yang 1980s Wu Yan Cha with your Ming Dynasty shipwreck teapot. Is there just, uh, you know, like Tian Mu uh, wastewater bowl sitting by the side, you know, Song Dynasty, Tian Mu bowl? Well, what <laughs> else are we brewing in here? We've got some Kangxi Dahua cups that you're pouring into. Well, you should actually, if you're going to be. Yeah, if you're, 
Uh, well, no, I'm just thinking, you know, if you're going to be drinking some nice 1980s yang chai, you might as well have some Kanchiera Dahua. But you, you can go with stem cups. Go, go for it. Mm, I, I lean Dahua with the yang chai, but, you know, we'll just have to cha have a chashi off and decide who's right. Okay. Mm. And I'll bring my hand on a CT cake. <laughs> Perfect. I'm glad everyone listening at home will totally be able to replicate this experience. Not, not, not exclusionary at all. Yeah, totally. Ichiko ichie. <laughs> no, no, it's the opposite. It's, it, it's every moment, all the time. Anyone can do this at home. <laughs> well, for anyone who's managed to stick around for this long, uh, we are always willing to, to host individuals for tea. We're in many cities around the world. I'm in New York. Pat's in Seattle. Zongjun is in Shanghai. So if you're in any of those locations and desperately want to have tea with one of us, uh, do please shoot us an email. We're very easy to contact and access, and we're always happy to have uh, you join us. So, and it's not like we're charging. Um, uh, I won't. Maybe I won't pass on my secret teachings, but uh, you know, ha happy to have someone around to drink tea with. Thank you, everyone, Absolutely. for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversation. Please join us again for the discussion on the next chapter: Why is phenomenism important?